Thank you for listening to Footnotes, a Fellowship Mosaic podcast. This is a space for us to dig deeper into scripture, what is happening in our community and culture, and continue the conversations we start on Saturday nights. We are excited to have you join us as we pursue truth, holiness, and redemption together. Well, hello and welcome back to Footnotes. Uh, we are here to talk about church planting and the Brooklyn team. We uh, we sat down at Fellowship Mosaic a couple of weeks ago and talked about Colin and Aaron Jackson and Scott Jones' plan to, to get trained up and sent out to start a new church in New York City, in the borough of Brooklyn. So we just wanted to have a minute to talk a little bit about that, what the strategy is, why this is a priority, why we're doing this. And uh, so I've, I'm sitting here with Scott. And Colin, hey, and Will Blanchard, oh, who man. is the team leader of church planting and multiplication here at Fellowship. So, uh, hey, Will, to get us started, like uh, church planting is kind of like professional church talk, and a lot of people in the world don't like use the term church planting. So, what is it, and why should we do it? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when we look at the topic of church planting, I, I think there's probably sort of three lenses that we can look at it sort of through to get our heads wrapped around kind of what it is and why it's important. On, on one level, to even look theologically to see that actually from Genesis to Revelation, that multiplication is something that is very near and dear to the heart and the character of God. Mm-hmm. And so you see literally in the opening verses of Genesis, God's instruction, his command mm-hmm. for human beings to be fruitful and to multiply. And this is not in response to the fall or to sin. It's actually a part of his design for creation. You sort of follow that theme all the way through Scripture, and you get to the point in Revelation where we see that actually all tribes, tongues, and nations will be present, worshiping the throne, uh, worshiping God the Father uh, one day. And you just see this theme of multiplication carried throughout all of Scripture and so on one lens, to look at multiplication or church planning through that, that lens of a theology of multiplication, I think is really important, sort of foundationally. But then secondly, sort of a second lens, uh, even on a very practical level, to, to realize that everything has sort of a life cycle. Um, churches have a life cycle. Human beings, we have a life cycle. And, and to realize that it's actually something like multiplication or the planting of new churches that really allows a church to remain perpetually relevant. Um, It's the people and the churches that we invest our lives into that will outlive us, that allows us to have an impact uh, on future generations. But then a a third lens to look at it, I I think, could even be just through the lens of the, the very personal, local mission and vision of Fellowship Bible Church. To think that we are a church that exists to produce and release spiritual leaders who know and express the authentic Christ to Northwest Arkansas and the world, and to consider the fact that a natural expression or sort of the next progression, if you will, of our mission and vision is that we're a church that produces and releases spiritual leaders, and we're a church that produces and releases churches who produce and release spiritual leaders. And so there's just a real beauty to sort of that seamless extension of this is who we are, this is what we do, and church planting is a big part of that. And so basically when we talk about church planting at like the most simple level, what we mean is sending people to start a new church. Absolutely. We're sending people to start something that doesn't currently exist, um, and a big part of the purpose of that is reaching people who aren't currently reached. You bet. And, uh, and so something I've heard you talk a lot about is statistically, new churches reach unbelievers better than any, any other church structure out there. Yeah, you, you see that actually new churches, just by their, their nature of starting to take the gospel to places where maybe there isn't influence or to take uh, a, an expression of church to places that fellowship is not reaching, just by that nature gives it sort of an, an edge or... Um, a, a desire um, to, to grow and to reach new people. And at the same time, as fellowship plants churches and begins to multiply, I think it also keeps the mission and vision sort of piping hot here at home and, and allows us to sort of sharpen our missional edge uh, as well. So, Will, you are lead a community group at Fellowship Mosaic. You're on the teaching team at Fellowship Mosaic. Um, but your day job 
is leading church planting teams. So what does that look like in your role? Like what is your job at Fellowship? You know, one of the things I, I've really tried to focus on these first few years here is uh, the, the word cultivation comes to my mind. Um, the, the training centers being a centralized team, we serve each of the four uh, congregations here at Fellowship. And um, these first few years, we've really tried to just cultivate that culture of multiplication. And so spending time with leaders within each congregation here at Fellowship, helping to, to cultivate a, a culture that not only produces and releases leaders, but has the potential to produce and release churches. And so coming alongside leaders like the, the guys in the studio today and uh, helping identify who are the people that, that God seems to be raising up with a desire or some would say even a call to, to plant a new church? And so then coming alongside those leaders and walking them through a season of assessing, of training, and launching, which is really what I've had the privilege to do um, this past year and a half with, uh, with Scott and Colin, to walk them through that process of assessing, of training, and preparing to launch. Um, it's a, that's a good segue when we think about that idea of calling. Um, Colin, it's been a big part of, of your story for a long time that you've had a desire to do this. Tell us a little bit about what leads you to, to feel this sense of call, this leading to go start a new church. First off, I want to start with Will Blanchard is such a gift to our church, and um, I'm learning it's more and more rare that uh, a church like f- just any church church would have somebody come on with the goal of seeing new disciples and new churches launched out of that church. And even just what that speaks to what we have here at Fellowship. I mean, it's very, uh, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, it's Antioch-esque, where there was this kind of hub for training up and building up planters and leaders that were doing good things in that city. But then the missionary journeys, the, the church planning journeys that took place all throughout the book of Acts, we're kind of in this hub. And, and it's really sweet to get to be a part of what God's doing here through Will Blanchard at Fellowship. So, uh, and Will, I mean, Will came on staff and I immediately was like, man, I want to do something like that. And uh, gosh, how long have you been on staff now? Five years. Five years. So, five years uh, I've been dreaming with Will about some of this. But, son of a church planner from Southeast Alabama, uh, my earliest. Uh, understanding of church was Chip Jackson in a roller rink. Uh, and that's kind of how I, I grew up. My ecclesiology was, um, yeah, you apparently can experience God's presence and worship in roller rinks in Podunk, Opelika, Alabama. And um, then uh, my dad calls it Jurassic Church. Turns out church planning is really hard um, and uh, can kind of chew you up and spit you out. And there was this thing happening up uh, in Northwest Arkansas, which again, we're in Alabama and Auburn at the time. And I remember the day they came in and said, hey, we're, we're going to go be a part of a, a church up in Northwest Arkansas. And we were like, why? <laughs> why would you do that? Um, and looking back, I can understand why. Um, God was doing something pretty special here through fellowship that we got to come be a part of. And so from cutting my teeth in southeastern Alabama and roller rinks to a really healthy established church like Fellowship, uh, that then I mean my most of my uh, adolescent and even into adult life has been church here at Mosaic, um, and yet really Matt Newman, Nick Rowland was also one of my youth pastors. They just kind of ingrained it into us through Fellowship of this um, this desire to to be a part of what God's doing and seeing the lost come to know him um, to Northwest Arkansas and the world. And so um, got to grow up at the student ministry here and some really beautiful experiences. But I remember in particular, Newman took us on a trip to Rwanda um, and kids across Africa. And it was the first time I sat in a, a, a really stinky, smelly school with a, a Muslim who, uh, came to, for the first time, understand Isa and want to go, I, I want to follow this. And I'm like a 18 year old going to the U of A and I'm like, whatever this is, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And, uh, came back to the university of Arkansas, got plugged in with international ministry, which led me, um, to be a part of a campus ministry, all still a part of mosaic here and just had this deep longing to go. I want to see, those who do not know Jesus come to know Jesus. I love what Will said earlier, just the, the influencing people where the 
um, where the church is not present, whether it's with de-churched or unchurched or those who just um, have never experienced um, the love of God. I, I long to be in those spaces. So uh, signed on to go with Stumo to India and uh, again, just fell in love. That was where I really started to see, I want to be a part of something in a city. Millions of people stacked on top of each other and I just loved it. Um, and wanted to continue to see, uh, I mean, we were reading the book of Acts every day and then just going out as a team and evangelizing. And I think that really set in, for me, set this kind of precedent to, okay, th- this is what I want to commit my life to. Um, came back to Northwest Arkansas to finish school. And uh, I remember writing in a journal, um, God, just give me to India. Like, that's all I want to do. I want to be a part of what your kingdom and you're doing. I had no context for church or planting at the time. It was all about like make disciples, make disciples. It was very individual and then came back and, uh, through a whole slew of God's sovereignty and, um, um, closed doors. Uh, my wife, Aaron and I said, we we actually feel really called and led to be here in Bentonville. And, uh, Nick Rowland said, Hey, why don't you come on staff? We got a youth pastor position opening up. And, uh, I told him I'd give him two years and that was, uh, in 2014. But that, that desire to still go never went away. Um, but it took me coming on staff at a church to really learn how to fall in love with the church. And I remember probably the first year, Nick, we were sitting in, a, in student ministry together and started to really develop an ecclesiology, uh, understanding of the local church, how the manifold wisdom of God is being put on display um, through the saints to the heavenly realms. And I was like, oh man, so whatever this local church thing is, is really important. Um, and then it, it, that, that desire to still go be a part of something never quite went away. However, it, it fellowship really became the place where I began one to heal. Um, I got to experience a lot of healing at this church. Um, also to be trained up as a leader, um, to learn how do you, how do you lead before you go try and like lead a disciple making movement? Can you make a disciple in your neighborhood and can you even train up and release a spiritual leader to make disciples? And so, there's so much here at Fellowship I've gotten to learn and grow and be a part of. And then um, really about five years ago, my wife and I were on our five-year anniversary, and we just felt this longing and desire to go be a part of something in the city. Um, so I, mean, I remember Nick, I was, we were kind of thinking like L.A., like maybe we can get to L.A. And so we would do some trips out to L.A. and pray and just ask God, could we be a part of something here? And we love LA and it was fun to vacation LA, but we really realized like, nah, this is more for like the fun. And I'll never forget the first time we went to New York together with the same prayer. And I was like, this is what I want to be a part of. I want to be here. And, uh, Brooklyn in particular, Manhattan's incredible, nothing against it, but Brooklyn just, um, God's already doing some things in that city that I was just like, oh, and it felt very different, but it felt like I was almost back on the streets of New Delhi with some opportunities with just tons of people on top of each other. And then our elders um, about two years ago put the parameter to we want to start seeing multiplication and church planting. And uh, Aaron and I, um, my wife, both felt very led to go, could we walk that track? Could we... um, go take the really good and beautiful things we've experienced here into a context like Brooklyn. So there's another, the, another side to this team. Um, And I remember as I was uh, there, as I was processing with Colin over the last several years, um, what was, what was always out front was church planting cities, church planting cities, church planting cities. Um, And I've, I've heard him say that for 10 years. Um, and then the other side was my friendship with Scott Jones. And what I heard from Scott was not church plant cities, not church plant cities, but New York, New York, New York, New York, New York. He, a deep, deep love for that city. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's been fun to watch in y'all's partnership is from Colin, I feel the like church planter, pioneer, charge the mountain personality. And in Scott, I hear a deep, deep love for the people of New York. So Scott, tell us about like that love for the city. What, what comes out, what, what in New York brings that out of you? What do you love about the people there? And why are you excited to be a part of that city? Dude, New York is the city of dreams, man. (laughs) And it's also the city of dead dreams, which makes it even better because people are hungry for some gospel. They're hungry for good news in some way. 
Um, I had been on the student team for a year. It was 2017, December. And I went up to New York. I had a lot of friends that were there from college. I had thought that I was going to live there post-college. I always kind of was um, pursuing ways to infiltrate myself into the culture community that, there in some way. And and I went to um, this uh, Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve service, um, long, long New Year's Eve worship service at this church that all my friends are going to, Church of the City. And I just experienced the body of Christ in that church in the middle of Manhattan, worshiping and interceding for multiple hours on end. Um, on New Year's Eve. And I remember thinking, oh, this is way better than Broadway. This is cooler than a Broadway show. This is this is way cooler than like the subway system or the hustle and bustle or the people you meet or like th- this is vibrant. You know, this is um the what's happening here is tangible. The movement that's happening is tangible. So um, I joined the um, the email chain for the community ministry at that church even though I didn't live up there. And and for years now, it's still in my inbox every week, I get an update for Church of the City's community ministry. And it, it was kind of just been this thing that that for multiple years, I just kind of see it in my inbox. And I'm like, oh yeah, I could join a community group, <laughs> but I don't live there. <laughs> but I, I never um, unsubscribed from the emails and, um, and continue to travel up there, continue to um, just be a part of my friends' lives, honestly, just like hearing f- ways that they were um, involved in the city and serving. And, and I'd travel up there and be a part of the church. And then uh, there was an opportunity to do a mission trip there. Um, and uh, um, I started getting connected with some more folks. My buddy, Willie, who is the team leader of Crew Inner City, in, uh, which houses in Brooklyn, and started to um, have some more ministry opportunities leading our students up to New York City. And started just to realize how much I loved uh, the disciple making movement and not just the prayer and intercession and vibrancy of what the spirit was doing. You know, I first got excited just for sensing how alive the spirit of God was in a city that so badly needed the kingdom to come. Um, But even more so how alive the spirit of God is in in people um, that are just trying to make disciples. Um, I've loved bringing our students up there to serve along with Willie and his crew and our city team because they just partner with churches, small church plants all over Brooklyn, all over New York City, all over the, all the boroughs, but specifically Brooklyn, and they just try to help those churches reach their community. And so I've been able to partner with this organization that's helping churches do the thing that Colin and I are hoping to go up there and do, just move into a neighborhood and start to bless that neighborhood and the community and the people that we see as much as we can. New York City has, gosh, 22 million people or something like that, and like 96%-ish are not evangelical. Um, So that's around like 21 million people who don't walk with Jesus. If that's not a compelling enough, you know, vision for a need for a church, I don't know what is. Um, But Colin and I both love the city. Um, we love walking around and meeting people. We love hearing the stories there. And um, and we have heard over and over from uh, pastors and people who are doing work in that city with um, the Spirit of God. We've heard just, just compelling invitation to come out and be a part of it. You know, the city needs you. The city needs churches. Every street, every neighborhood needs another community. Um, so, so we really see that there's a humongous opportunity for lots and lots and lots of people to move up there like we're doing and fall in love with the city and make disciples. We're excited to be one of them. Okay. So Will, tell us the process as, as fellowship prepares to send and launch, you've got people with a heart, you've got an identified need. So how, how do people like, what happens next? How does this play out from here? You know, one of the things we've been trying to do the last few years is develop a, a clear church multiplication pathway that is, is highly customizable and adaptable, really initially to serve the four congregations here at Fellowship, but just a clear pathway for as God begins to sort of stir and raise up leaders within each congregation to have a clear pathway for how we could come alongside those leaders and walk them through a season of assessment, of training, and of launch. And so... This past year with Colin and Scott, we walked through a a season of assessment. And one of the partners that um, we continue to work with is uh, Stadia. And they've got one of the most robust, 
uh, I think, in-depth, well-rounded, sort of holistic uh, assessment uh, discovery centers uh, in the country. And so we walked through a season of assessment with Stadia, who took a look at Colin and Scott and Aaron uh, and gave them sort of some things that they can work on to prepare for before they launch, but also looking at them going, you've, you've got the makeup or the, the, the DNA to be a successful church planter because that's a whole host of skill and character and, and knowledge and even passion vision pieces that really need to be present in the life of a successful church planter. And so we've walked through that. We're now in a season where we're training, really looking at some of the nuts and bolts that need to be in place to think through uh, what it looks like to plant a church, particularly in an urban setting and environment. But as we enter into sort of a launch phase and have the, the, the thrill of bringing a proposal to our elders to consider and what it, does it look like to launch these guys uh, to Brooklyn, what I'm so excited about is even a, an approach to planting that's not like sort of storming the beaches of Normandy. How do we raise up a bunch of planters and just send them out there and say good luck to them? But what does it look like for fellowship to, to launch church planters and then continue to go the distance together and see true kingdom movement and partnership and networking with other like-minded churches that really get excited about a, a name nowhere, sort of fingerprints of Jesus everywhere approach. And so that's the process that we've been walking through. Um, and we're anticipating this fall being able to bring uh, a proposal to our elders for consideration. Also to see this past week um, as Mickey and Robert and Gary cast vision for that 50 by 50 multiplication fund here at Fellowship that will fuel works like this and others that are beginning to emerge. And uh, it, it really does feel like in many ways, probably the word that comes to my mind is, is that of a, a gift. It feels like a gift to be in the process in this church for such a time as this with, with the people that God is uh, allowing us to do ministry with. And I just have such, I guess, great anticipation uh, about what God is uh, is going to do through some steps of obedience and faith on the horizon. So fall, but doing work and training and, and research over the, the summer. The hope is a, a, a very clear proposal in the fall for launch and all that fun stuff. So in between now and then, I'll ask both Colin and Scott, if there were one um, prayer or ask of the Mosaic people over the next six months, what would you, uh, what would you put to them? Man, I mean, other than just praying provision over the people we meet in the city and the relationships that God would lead us to in order to form leaders and groups and disciple making movements of community out there, that that's first on my mind, just the people we meet and the ways that God allows us to be involved in people's stories and and create um, community, but I guess more so, uh, more so pressing in this time period, uh, clarity and understanding and vision for how we would raise support from our body. And uh, honestly, like prayer, prayerful support. I, I just Colin and I are desperate to can to really start um, building up a, a group of people or or friends and family alike who are just coming alongside us and interceding for all the things that we don't even know to pray for. Um, and then New York City comes with a slew of of financial burdens that we don't even really understand yet living there. I mean, we just know we've heard from many, many church planners and people who have done this, people who have moved to the city, that it's just a financial burden. And so I think we feel incredibly blessed by fellowships, uh, support for us, and also just still prayerful and hopeful for God to come through for all the potential financial burdens that would come our way uh, upon moving up there and and so support is big for us, whether it's financially or prayerfully, um, hoping to be supported really deeply by people in our body and, and really excited to continue those or start those conversations, you know? Yeah. Um, go there for and make disciples of all nations. And uh, could we continue to be, I love Dr. Cup said, fellowship was never meant to institutionalize. We want to be a part of a movement, and I get goosebumps every single time he says it. So whether it's in our neighborhoods here in Northwest Arkansas, whether it's on the streets of Brooklyn, or whether it's uh, to the nations, um, let's continue to walk with God faithfully, abide well, and uh, make disciples together as a church. 
So if you, there will be much more clarity coming, much more, um, much more direction on ways to partner. If you are looking to partner with these guys right now, um, two immediate steps, the 50 by 50 multiplication fund is open today. And that is the fund that will be, um, used from fellowship perspective to help send these guys. And so, um, an immediate step, if you want to give financially is to give to that multiplication fund. And then I encourage you, um, reach out to these guys and, and they would love to sit down with you. And, uh, whether it's over lunch, coffee, dinner, whatever, Whatever, and tell you more and uh, and figure out ways that you can partner with them and start praying right away. It's a pretty sweet thing that we at uh, Fellowship Mosaic get to be a part of this. And I um, I remember I've heard it shared many times that when um, people donated the land for Fellowship Fayetteville, the statement they said to Mickey was, how often in your life do you get to be a part of something this significant? Um, and I would say th- the same thing about us sending uh, these two families to, to New York is how often in life do we get to be a part of something this significant? We celebrated 40 years of fellowship um, these last few weeks, and uh, I, I'm already dreaming of what stories will be told at the Brooklyn 40-year celebration um, and, and what all we're going to hear about happening there. So uh, we commit that to God and uh, excited to partner with these, these guys um, in the launch of a new church. Thanks for listening, Fellowship Mosaic. Have a great week.